Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Application of long read pack biosequencing for high resolution metagenomics. Presented by Dr. Jonas Korlach, Chief Scientific Officer, Pacific Biosciences. I am Kaylee Bach of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Type your questions into the drop-down box and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonas Korlach. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, allowing me to um, once again present at the lab conference. I think this is my at least my third time, so it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, yeah, today um, the topic will be metagenomics and how long read pack biosequencing can be applied to um, a higher resolution picture of those um, communities. Um, this is the topics for today's talk. Uh, I'll give a very brief uh, overview of the company and also the technology and where we are on uh, an update with regard to the performance and then the most uh, time I'll spend on talking about the metagenomics applications and opportunities that are associated with PEC biosequencing. So for those of you who don't know PEC bio, Pacific Biosciences is, uh, came out of Cornell University, um, founded in um, 2000. It's now headquartered in California in the Bay Area. And uh, we have uh, one product and associated consumables. That's a SQL system commercializing the single real-time platform and currently about 440 employees. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that we have a very experienced management team. Uh, you see up there on the left, Mike Hunkapiller, um, who is con by many considered the father of commercial DNA sequencing. He ran ABI for many years. He's our CEO. And then I want to mention Kathy Ordonez. She is our chief commercial officer. Um, she ran um, a, a Roche and Raindance, very experienced with regard to commercializing complex biotechnological uh, systems. Now, by way of motivation as an introduction, um, of course, um, many of you realize already that uh, there are many challenges associated with sequencing metagenomic community, uh, communities, and this has been uh, commented on in many papers and perspectives. Uh, here's just two examples. And um, of course, the challenge there is that these are very heterogeneous populations. Um, they're uneven with regard to their abundances. So some of the species and strains are at a high abundance, some are very rare, and they're also not static. They're highly dynamic uh, as the environment changes, the communities change, and so forth. And so it's been recognized and commented on that the short read sequencers are really not very well suited to characterize these kinds of communities. So uh, just one quote on the bottom right there from this paper on the left, uh, that even if you have the easiest communities, these are mock communities where you know what's going in and they're at even abundance because these are artificial communities. The best assemblers only reconstruct about two thirds of what's actually there. So you're missing one third completely. And the two thirds that are there are in contexts um, that are uh, you know, just slightly larger than 150 base pairs. So uh, you have an incomplete view and a fragmented view using short read uh, uh, sequencing. And so with regard to sequencing performance as it pertains to um, characterizing these metagenomic communities, um, there are of course three criteria that uh, you want to look at. This is uh, generally so, so whenever you want to look at a sequencing technology, those are the three areas you want to evaluate with regard to performance. I'll talk about cost and workflow at the end of the presentation, but in terms of just in terms of quality of the sequence, uh, these are the three topics that you want to look at. Uh, the first one is how long are the reads? Second one is how accurate is the result that you're getting? And the third one is, is there any bias um, with regard to what you can sequence? Meaning, can you sequence all the DNA that's a part of your sample? 
So with regard to that performance and PacBio's um, uh, current performance, we now have average read lengths that are greater than 15,000 bases for genomic DNA and about twice that, about 30,000 bases on average for amplicons. And I'll give examples in both of those areas. That's about two orders of magnitude longer than what you can do with Illumina sequencing. And I've um, listed on the right two representative uh, performance examples. And you can see that um, there is a read length distribution. So on the x-axis, you see the read length. And on the y-axis is uh, the histogram, the bins of the number of reads in that with that read length. And you can see there's a long tail. That's because in single molecule real-time sequencing, some polymerases go faster than others and, and will create longer reads. Um, and of course, there is um, twice as many bases in a 40 kb read compared to a 20 kb read. So most of the data will be in that long tail in the distribution. So that's expressed by the parameter that's called read n50. That's the read length uh, beyond which um, half of the data are contained therein. So for genomic DNA, the read n50 is over 30 kb. And for amplicons, the read n50, you notice that the scale is different uh, on the bottom compared to the top, is over 70 kb. So half the data uh, with amplicons are now contained in reads that are greater than 70,000 bases or higher. With regard to uh, consensus accuracy, that's the final result that you're getting. It's been uh, demonstrated and noted um, in many papers that PecBio has very high consensus accuracy, even though on the single read level, the errors is relatively higher compared to Illumina. Um, the errors are random, so they wash out as you build uh, coverage. And so at about 25-fold coverage, you get to QV40 or 99.99% accuracy. And about 50-fold coverage, you get to 99.999% or less than one error in 100,050. And then with regard to bias, uh, with regard to, let's say, GC content or sequence complexity, where you have dinucleotide or trinucleotide repeats and very low complexity sequence, it's also been described and demonstrated that PacBio has the least bias of any technology. And um, on the right, I'm showing just at one example with regard to the GC content of the DNA. So on the on the left of the graph, you have highly AT-rich DNA. And on the right uh, of the graph, you have GC-rich DNA. And um, on the y-axis is the sequencing coverage. And you can see that's very even, much more even than you have with other technologies. And that means that regardless of what the sequence is, you get the same kind of representation and the same quality associated with the uh, PecBio data. So this has been, uh, these. What we this has been commented on by the community about the advantages of smart sequencing. Uh, the middle paper uh, was a specific evaluation of different technologies. In this case, Illumina, Ion Torrent, Complete Genomics, and PacBio, showing that PacBio has the least bias uh, in sequence data. And on the bottom is a relatively new paper, review paper, that um, this particular paper is for medical diagnostics. But um, it is generally true that uh, the previous myth that smart sequencing was too error prone to be useful is now being expunged and replaced by evidence that it actually offers advantages over short read sequencers. So fundamentally, what we were trying to do here is to build a system and a sequencing technology that has uh, excellent performance in all three of these criteria simultaneously, uh, whereas the other technologies, uh, short reads, obviously they don't have um, and um, actually quite considerable bias. Um, and with other long read technologies like um, uh, Tenex Genomics or Oxford Nanopore, they do create long or linked reads, but have deficiencies in the accuracy and again in the bias. And so um, you're really not um, leveraging the full potential that you could get from a sequencing performance that has uh, very good performance in all three areas simultaneously. And so um, the price we had to pay initially was the throughput. And over the lifetime of the commercialization of this technology over the past six years, we have built on that foundation of high quality and increased the throughput by uh, well over a thousand fold now, first on the PacBio RS2, the instrument on the left, and now the smaller system, uh, the SQL system, which currently gives about up to 10 gigabases per smart cell with genomic DNA and up to 20 gigabases per smart cell with amplicons. And then um, in the system, there's a robotics unit that allows you to run up to 16 smart cells 
in uh, with the press of a button and in a walkaway operation. So if you multiply those numbers, uh, you get to some fairly serious throughput per machine run. Uh, so that's the walkaway operation of the machine um, processing one smart cell after another of um, uh, several hundred um, or up to 200 gigabases or 0.2 terabases. So this has then has led to um, quite a number of high profile uh, publications. There are by now well over 3,300 peer reviewed publications to date. Um, on average, there's about five new papers that are published highlighting the utility of smart sequencing every day. And so you can see that, and we believe that it's because of that underlying performance, um, we believe we've, that's the reason for this um, fairly dr rapid increase in the number of publications. So I would like to focus um, today, um, so you know, these papers that I described were in all areas that are relevant to human health, um, um, plants and animals, nutrition, uh, human uh, genomics, of course, and then infectious disease and so forth. But today, uh, I would like to focus just on um, metagenomics. And so um, in the area of discussing metagenomic applications and opportunities, uh, there are three topics that I'd like to cover. The first one is targeted sequencing of the 16S gene for classification. The second one is shotgun metagenomics. And then at the end, I want to give and uh, highlighting some opportunities in transcriptomes and epigenomes uh, in these metagenomic communities. So um, in order to, um, to highlight um, the ability, the unique ability of PecBio to get highly accurate um, results from these complex communities, I want to introduce um, another way of getting the sequencing um, consensus uh, with PecBio sequencing. So on the left, you see what I would call standard sequencing, where you have a number of molecules. They're sequenced um, separately, and then you build either um, through resequencing and mapping to a reference sequence or through overlap to novo assembly. You build uh, co coverage, and then you have a final consensus sequence that is your final result. With PEC biotechnology, it's uniquely possible to get highly accurate sequencing results on an individual DNA molecule level. And we call this circular consensus sequencing, or CCS. Um, this feature is not available with any other technology, be it short read or long read technology. And the way it works is that we ligate these hairpin adapters to a linear double strand DNA molecule so that it becomes topologically circular, even though structurally it's still linear. And then the polymerase will start um, reading the DNA and it will um, start going around in a circle, opening up this hairpin structure we call a smart bell and continue to sequence in a uh, rolling circle mode. So what that means is that the polymerase will sequence this individual strand of DNA multiple times, the forward strand and the reverse strand. And uh, so it's possible to get multiple reads on the same DNA molecule. And then you can build consensus from that and get a very highly accurate read from that individual molecule. In this particular case, for example, identifying that there was an additional green mutation that on the left would have been washed out um, in the multi-molecule consensus. So we would uh, then use the left standard sequencing for things like de novo assembly, and I'll get to that in the later part of the talk. And then um, on the right is specifically useful for characterizing these complex metagenomic mixtures where essentially every DNA, mo DNA molecule is uh, unique and is different, and you need to call them on the individual DNA molecule level. Regardless of which um, mode of sequencing you use, um, you get the same kind of high consensus accuracy and how it evolves with coverage that I uh, described earlier. So with regard to uh, 16S sequencing, which is now enabled through the long read lengths with PecBio, uh, there was a paper really highlighting that this is a new gold standard in um, uh, microbial community profiling with regard to, to their phylogeny. Um, this was a paper a little while ago from key opinion leaders and key uh, leading researchers in this particular area. Uh, and they applied smart sequencing for microbial community profile, generating full-length 16S um, RNA gene sequences with high throughput. And as a new term, they call these phylotags. And so in the paper, um, they uh, demonstrate that this new utility fills important gaps in the tree of life, improved classification, and has important implications for inferring the, the metabolic potential and biogeochemical roles 
of these microorganisms in natural and human engineered ecosystems. Um, so they highlight that um, having a full length se sequence of this particular gene is much more powerful um, through all taxonomic levels. But you see in particular at the genus and species level, um, you get much higher classification percentages compared to on the right is the V4 segment that's typically utilized with these I tags with Illumina sequencing. And on the bottom is an example um, demonstrating how you can get fooled by just looking at a portion of a gene. So with the V4, here you have two Salmonella subspecies that are identical in sequence in that V4 element. However, when you do the full length PEC bio 16 s sequencing, you see that they're quite different in other variable regions and can be distinguished. Uh, and then the authors uh, went into a natural environment. This is a lake in Canada. And without going into much detail, all the black bars that you see were uh, classified according to the PecBio full length information, but were ambiguous according to the Illumina technology. And so you see there's a lot of information that was missed with the short read technologies that is now elucidated with PecBio sequencing. Another example that's been published um, is about fecal uh, microbiome transplantation, very important uh, and very successful for treating Clostridium difficile infections. And this paper by European researchers um, looked at the fecal transplant evolution in the uh, recipient and found that it um, can take many months, six to seven months, before uh, there's a stable adapted microbiome in the gut of the recipient matching the donor. So it can take quite some time and uh, getting very detailed and uh, comprehensive information about uh, these families um, that are um, being transplanted. So you can see here that before the um, FMT on the left, there was a, a much lower diversity of, um, and this is at the strain, in some cases at the strain level, a much lower diversity. And then after the fecal mi microbiome transplant, which is what you want, a much more diverse, much richer uh, microbiome. I do want to point out that this paper is quite interesting. Uh, this is a side note, also looking at the bacteriophages uh, in the gut microbiome, which is typically not done. Um, but of course, it's now being recognized that the phages are also very important for human health and um, um, uh, well-being. There are other papers that I won't have time to talk about today, demonstrating the utility on full-length 16S sequencing. Um, there's a microbiome paper, um, and these are more methods paper, another one for uh, Clostridium difficile um, um, infections. And then this is in the uh, ecology and environmental sciences, looking at soil bacterial communities, looking at communities with implications on atmospheric nitrogen deposition, uh, et cetera. So uh, this has been demonstrated that you can get a really high quality um, information um, from full-length 16S sequencing. And there's actually a talk in about one hour. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, stay on. Uh, Mark Driscoll um, from Shoreline Bio will talk about applying this um, in various uh, ways with regard to uh, microbiome profiling. So I encourage you to check out his talk as part of the event as well. With regard to shotgun metagenomics, of course, um, there's now a movement towards not just looking at what is there, uh, but understanding that more comprehensively by looking at the entire genome. And again, this uh, unique um, CCS capability that I described earlier um, allows you to get much higher resolution uh, for shotgun um, metagenomics with PecBio. Uh, what we can do here is we can take, let's say, two or three kilobase fragments and then again, in this circular consensus sequencing mode, go around that molecule, sequencing it multiple times, and get very high read accuracy, greater than, let's say, 99.7%. And that allows you to get a much more contiguous view of um, sections of those genomes. Uh, you can often get multiple complete genes uh, per sequence read, and that requires no assembly. And um, so in general, PecBio is very powerful for high-resolution shotgun metagenomics at the genus, species, and strain level. And I'd like to give some examples that highlight this capability. Um, so this was a paper by um, European researchers demonstrating that with this circular consensus sequence data, you can improve um, metagenome assemblies and taxonomic binning. Uh, the CCS uh, provided a dramatic improvement in the assembly of the universal marker gene in comparison to the Illumina HiSeq 2000 data. 
and this capability enabled the enhancements in genome reconstructions of these uncultured microorganisms that inhabit complex communities. So just as one example from this paper, uh, comparing directly PEC-Bio and Illumina in the same sample, this was a bioreactor sample, there, was, there were two Clostridia species, um, one Clostridia and one Firmicutes, that accounted for about 40% of the entire uh, biomass and the entire community. And those were uh, basically missed with the Illumina technology, uh, largely because of extreme sequence context. And those are indicated in blue and uh, turquoise on the left. And you can see there's very little blue and turquoise on the right. Um, so the majority, the, almost half of the um, uh, biomass was missed with the Illumina. So it's not just a rare species that you miss with Illumina. Sometimes it can be even the dominant species. And so, uh, as I mentioned, there can be multiple complete genes per sequence, um, per sequence read that comes off the instrument. This is an example um, that was presented last year at the AGBT meeting of a cow rumen microbiome. Uh, and you can see that uh, for these um, calves or adult cows, on average, uh, in this table on the rightmost column, you get two to three genes per read. And that's very powerful because um, if you find a gene of interest, let's say an antibiotic resistance gene, you have at least one or maybe two genes on the same molecule that then tell you uh, which organism this particular gene is um, um, a portion of. And so um, in this work, it was also demonstrated that there are benefits over the Illumina technology. Um, in orange, you see the Illumina uh, coverage. In blue, you see PacBio. And on the leftmost um, side of this graph, those are the rare species that may only have uh, you know, one-fold coverage or so. So you see those molecules very rarely. But because of the high accuracy with PacBio, uh, you get very detailed and um, much more contiguous information that allows you to classify it. And so you have a much better view of the, um, the rare species, which is sometimes um, counterintuitive. Many people think that because you don't have the read depth with PecBio compared to Illumina, you're not as sensitive to the rare species. But that's um, um, only partly uh, the truth, because um, with the longer contiguity of 3KB, if you have one read that um, is immediately uh, useful and classifiable, Whereas if you have one 150 base Illumina read, you may not be able to um, make inferences from that. And so then uh, you can compare this uh, with the Illumina data. Um, these are uh, assemblies from the CCS reads. They generate long contigs, um, uh, some in excess of 100,000 bases, uh, much longer than what you see with Illumina. So in this picture on the, uh, the black uh, bar is the PEC bio contigs of just over 100 KB. And uh, on the bottom uh, in gray, you see the Illumina contigs, which are much shorter and they're concordant. So uh, it shows that the assembly that we made with PecBio was correct. And then you can add uh, some data from an unshared library to have bigger molecules and, that, and then do a de novo assembly. And in some cases you get complete microbial genomes, which is quite unprecedented for difficult microbial communities such as the cow rumen that's been a, um, an environment that's been very tough to uh, study. And so um, you, we have one complete genome, another nearly complete four megabase genome, many contexts that were in excess of 100 uh, KB. And the researchers shown here from Israel um, who we collaborated with are very excited about uh, these unprecedented uh, quality results. Um, now I, I want to, uh, speaking about uh, complete genomes, um, while sometimes it's not, um, regarded as the sort of standard microbiome community work, in many cases, it's not possible with PecBio to get complete genomes from these um, microbial communities uh, with a de novo assembly. And um, that allows unprecedented insight into the complete blueprint of some of these um, organisms. I want to give just a couple examples. This was a collaboration with um, Julie Segre and Julia O oh when, um, when she was still at the NIH, now she's Jackson Laboratories, uh, resolving the complexity of human skin metagenomes using smart sequencing. Um, we were able to obtain a high quality closed genome of a previously uncharacterized carinobacterium and its bacteriophage from a skin metagenomic sample. An earlier paper in Science uh, looked at the human gut and uh, determined the complete genomes of some of these bacteroides genomes. And the paper itself was about 
trying to correlate the fitness and diet responsiveness in the human gut um, with regard to the microbiomes. There are many other examples that I won't go into. Um, looking at the complete genomes from symbionts that are in uh, fungus growing ants, uh, looking uh, at the second papers of termites, uh, looking at Shimonella, and these are in the microbiomes of freshwater fish, um, and um, uh, a third paper, a more methods paper. And then also for the purposes of probiotics, um, complete genomes of probiotic bacteria that were isolated from the gut of either infants or uh, healthy adults, uh, looking at uh, contamination and food safety, uh, both in um, uh, human and also in animal and veterinary uh, safety. Uh, a couple other examples of, I, I thought, really clever uses of the technology for shotgun metagenomics uh, that are a bit different. Uh, this is a Finnish group um, evaluating the mobility potential of antibiotic resistance genes in environmental resistance without metagenomics is the title. And so uh, it's, it's quite clever what the um, uh, researchers have done here, focusing on the antibiotic resistance genes, or ARG, as you see in this figure. And what you want to know is whether those antibiotic resistance genes are within mobile genetic elements, meaning they're still capable of being transferred from one bacterium to another, or whether they're essentially dormant and uh, will not be uh, mobile. And so the researchers came up with a very nice inverse PCR-based targeted uh, approach, just getting at those elements, sequencing them. And then because of the long read lengths with PecBio, you get the flanking sequences of those uh, antibiotic resistance genes that allow you to determine whether or not they're within mobile genetic elements or not. So this is going at a specific question that's at the heart of many studies, looking at the resistance, the antibiotic resistance, and being very efficient in pulling out the information that you want. Uh, the last example also in the area of antibiotic resistance genes was looking at uh, cow manure and uh, applying smart sequencing to uh, significantly extend the roster of functional antibiotic resistance genes found in animal gut bacteria. Uh, the problem here is that because we've treated um, livestock with antibiotics for so many decades that then goes into the soil and selects for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so this study used phosmid sequencing actually to get a much better understanding and have lots of discoveries of new antibiotic resistance genes. On the left, on this bar chart, uh, only the leftmost bar um, is something that has any match in the GenBank database with BLAST. All the other bars in the middle are new discoveries and had essentially no um, similarity with GenBank. And then on the right, um, in this picture, you see that, again, because of the long read lengths, you get an immediate understanding, not just of the antibiotic resistance gene, but also how they're organized within their hosts, um, within those bacteria, and what um, particular genes are right next to it, et cetera. So there are many other publications that I can't go into. Here's a list, and I invite you to look at our uh, website under pecb.com publications. We have a complete list and searchable database of all the publications. So then lastly, on uh, the topic of transcriptomes and epigenomes, uh, we're excited about uh, collaboration with New England Biolabs, looking at full length uh, microbial RNA-seq. Um, so as you know, um, the read lengths have been utilized in isoseq and eukaryotes for uh, quite a few years. And we have adapted this protocol with the smart capable uh, seq reagents from NEB to make that possible also now in bacteria and in metagenomic communities. And of course, that's exciting because you don't only want to know what's there, but in many cases you want to actively growing what is being expressed and how it's being regulated. And uh, so this paper uh, highlights the methodology and first applications that you now get a much more complete and comprehensive view of bacterial transcriptomes. Uh, you can see here the operons being uh, expressed, and each line, each of those gray lines, uh, represents a full-length uh, transcript. And you can see already uh, visually very clearly that it's not nearly as simple as having just transcripts that span the operon. In many cases, uh, one or two genes, either in the beginning or the end, are missing. Uh, so there's a lot of regulation that is much more difficult to get at uh, with short-read technologies and is immediately apparent with the long-read PEC biosequencing. 
And then finally, with regard to the uh, DNA modification detection, this is to characterize the chemical modifications that are put on DNA by the bacteria, uh, methylation marks, um, N6-methyladenine, 4-methylcytosine, 5-methylcytosine. Um, we uh, described, I think about uh, six or seven years ago, that the progression of the polymerase is delayed by the presence of a methyl group in the template strand. So the polymerase uh, runs along the DNA, and then if it encounters a methylated base, that methylated base acts as a little speed bump. And the polymerase will uh, take a little bit longer time to get uh, past that, and we measure that in real time and thereby can infer whether or not there were methylation marks on the um, DNA. This has been um, described and published upon in many papers, well over 150 papers. Again, um, I've listed them here, but they're all available in our publication database, which is, uh, the link is on the bottom. And so um, the community has recognized that with PEC biosequencing, we have now entered a new era of bacterial epigenomics. Um, and uh, this was an older uh, review article on the top, a newer one from a few months ago. Um, looking at um, so-called phase variants. Those are variation in bacteria with regard to their pathogenicity often um, that are mediated by methylation. And um, this is an excellent review article summarizing the work that has been done uh, in this particular area. There, are, All this information is being um, recorded and curated by the Rebase uh, database that's uh, curated by uh, New England Biolabs. And you can see there are uh, well over 5,500 records by now in the PEC biodata. And uh, if you have bacterial PEC biodata, uh, please submit them to the Rebase database so that the entire community can uh, benefit from that information. Even if you don't use it for your own research, it's very important biological information that is uh, useful for others. With regard to methylation in metagenomics, um, there are a number of examples highlighting that this is an important topic. Uh, this is a paper from Eric Triplett in Florida looking at the methylation of gut microbiomes and asking the question whether in conjunction with a disease, in this particular case uh, type 1 diabetes and the development of autoimmunity against this disease, whether there are differences. And um, the paper describes the profound differences in the dominant bacterium that was a bacteroides in the extent of dam methylation between two children um, that had a high genetic risk for type 1 diabetes and a year prior to the development of type 1 diabetes in one of these children, but not in the other. Um, so this is uh, certainly no proof, but it's an indication that we should look at the methylation status of the gut microbiome in addition to just the sequences. Um, this is an area from the agriculture, an example from the agricultural space. Um, you know, 12 years ago, there was a paper um, showing that there are dramatic differences in the methylation changes during symbiosis of these bacteria that form associations with the root nodules of um, nitrogen-fixing um, uh, bacteria that form a symbiosis with plants. And of course, back then, there was no commercial smart sequencing. And so this was a paper um, just looking at the uh, transition from the free living state to the nodule of those bacteria in the soil and finding that there are dramatic methylation changes. So I always hoped that someone would apply smart sequencing. And this was then done 10 years later in 2016, again by Eric Triplett, looking in detail about the methylation and gene expression data in the development of um, one of those um, bacteria during symbiosis. And there are dramatic changes. 35% um, of all the genes are affected. Um, there are over 10% of these methylation changes are in this um, what he called symbiosis island. So you can see that on the bottom, um, that is denoted by the two um, dashed lines. There's a region in the genome that changes um, dramatically, both with regard to methylation and expression. And um, the methylation is, um, uh, there's one methylation motif that's uh, specific to symbiosis, and um, 768 genes have methylation and significant expression changes. So this is an, um, a phenomenon that you absolutely have to measure and understand if you want to understand uh, symbiosis and the interaction of bacteria with uh, plants in this particular case. Uh, and then finally, uh, one um, uh, quite recent example from Gang Fang at uh, Mount Sinai um, School of Medicine in New York City, uh, looking at 
harnessing and leveraging the methylation information to improve binning um, for these metagenomic communities. And this Nature Biotechnology paper, he um, looked at the endogenous epigenetic barcodes, the methylation signals that he can then use as barcodes from the PEC biodata to resolve either the individual reads or the assembled contigs into species and strain level bins. It allowed him to link the plasmids and other mobile genetic elements to their host species because they carry the same methylation marks. Um, they're in the same bacterial cell. So the methyl transferases will methylate both the chromosome and the plasmids and mobile genetic elements. And so it very nicely complements existing methods to enable more accurate sequence binning. And so if you're interested in that, um, I encourage you to look up uh, Gang's paper. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close and just summarize. And I mentioned that, you know, I talked about sequencing performance, but of course, uh, cost and the workflow is also very important for uh, making it into efficient uh, assays and uh, making that routine. And so um, with regard to the workflow um, and the cost, we have introduced an accelerated library prep or express library prep, as we call it. Previously, um, the library prep uh, took about a day, but with this new protocol that we rolled out a few months ago, it's significantly faster. It only takes three hours. Um, it uh, um, requires less starting material, about two and a half times less. It's more efficient uh, because you handle the DNA differently. It's just an add only uh, workflow. And because you're handling the DNA less, um, there's also less damage to the DNA. And so you have longer read lengths and improved sequencing performance. And of course, it's amenable to automation. Um, and this is currently available for the uh, long fragment um, uh, protocols. Um, with regard to the cost, um, one example is um, with regard to barcodes, just like any other technologies, PEC biosequencing has barcodes, 384 of them that have been optimized for smart sequencing, which then allows you to multiplex hundreds of targets and samples, pool them together and sequence them on a single smart cell. The On the bottom then, the analysis software automatically demultiplexes and puts each barcode in a separate bin and then uh, does the analysis CCS or multi-molecule consensus. And this can be uh, scaled up quite uh, dramatically. Um, here is a paper recently published entitled The Sequel to Sanger, so a sequel to Sanger sequencing, Amplicon sequencing that scales by Paul Hebert and uh, colleagues from the Biodiversity Institute in Guelph, Canada. And they barcoded and pulled up to 10,000 amplicons in a single smart cell and found that it was um, both more accurate and in, in that the smart sequencing provided more complete coverage, especially for amplicons with homopolymer tracts, which are more challenging for Sanger um, sequencing, and also more cost effective, 40 fold cheaper uh, compared to Sanger sequencing, and still an order of magnitude less um, expensive compared to both Illumina and ion torrent. Um, so um, I realize that there's a strong notion in the community that it's about cost per base um, and so forth, but we like to think about it more in terms of cost of per project because sequencing applications are now very different. And so different technologies have different strengths and weaknesses. And so um, a technology that may be too expensive in one area may actually be much cheaper in another. And so you really can't um, sort of globally say cost per base because that would not be appropriate over all the different application spaces. So as a case in point, um, uh, Paul and colleagues ran a project with Sanger sequencing here in characterizing 200 specimens that cost them $1.2 million or about $120,000 uh, $120, with short read technologies. And now it's um, uh, you know only $36,000. So, um, about tenfold uh, less than with Illumino Iron Torrent and dramatically less with, with Sanger. So um, with that, I would like to close and uh, I hope that I've given you a good overview of the unique capabilities that PEC biosequencing can provide in the area of metagenomics, uh, in the area of uh, targeted sequencing, 16S, or you can adapt that to other genes of interest that you're interested in. With regard to shotgun metagenomics, being able to get much more contiguous information on two or three kilobase fragments and getting complete microbial genomes um, from these representatives of these communities. And then emerging applications harnessing um, the PEC biotechnology, both for RNA research, for transcriptomes, 
and uh, very important, the methylation information for the epigenomes. And so with that, I'll stop. Uh, this is my acknowledgement slide, actually, because uh, you notice that most of the things that I talked about were not done by us, but by the scientific community. And so we are extremely grateful um, for their efforts and time applying the PEC biotechnology, in many cases, moving it forward. And uh, we are indebted to the researchers' efforts. And it's been a, a great uh, journey and uh, collaborations with all of them um, to apply PEC bio to uh, metagenomics, but also to other areas. So with that, I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to present uh, at the meeting today. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kolach, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question asks, what are your plans for future improvements on sample prep, sequencing, and data analysis? Yeah, thank you, certainly. Um, so I, I uh, focused on what is uh, possible today, but we have um, obviously plans to improve on all three aspects of a sequencing project, sample prep, sequencing, and data analysis, as you mentioned. And so um, just as a few examples, so in terms of sample preparation, the Express Library Kit that I mentioned, which is currently available for the long insert um, uh, cases, um, we plan to make available for all types of analysis, so amplicons, for example, 16S um, analysis, and so forth. So um, that will be uh, something that is a future improvement on the sample prep and working with the uh, community to automate that for people who have lots and lots of samples that you don't want to pipette by hand uh, anymore. With regard to the sequencing, uh, we will continue uh, on this path uh, that I mentioned on the thousand-fold improvement since the inception. We believe that there is still quite a lot of uh, runway left on improving that even further. Uh, we're targeting about a two-fold increase in the throughput per smart cell for this year. And then next year, we will introduce a new chip that will have an eight-fold higher multiplex. Um, so right now, there's a one million features on the smart cell, and uh, next year, we'll introduce an eight million uh, feature smart cell. So that will directly translate to um, a corresponding uh, throughput increase in the number of reads. And of course, I realize that the number of reads is very critical for many metagenomic applications, especially where you have um, uh, very complex communities, but also making it more cost efficient because um, in many cases, even now on SQL, uh, people multiplex, for example, 16S experiments because you need about, let's say, many people need about 10 to 30,000 total reads per sample um, out of a smart cell right now you get about 400,000 reads. Um, and so you can multiplex up to 10 or 12 samples in that case um, with barcodes. Um, once the 8 million chip comes uh, online, um, that of course you can either get an even more multiplex factor or um, uh, you can study more deeply the very complex uh, microbial communities where you, get, where you need more reads and um, uncover these rare species. And then with regard to data analysis, uh, we're working very closely with the um, community, um, trying to incorporate um, the uh, knowledge and the databases. And um, so we have a uh, smart link, a smart analysis package. That's the um, uh, PacBio um, maintained um, software package. But then there is a, um, and we will continue to add features to that, make it easier um, with regard to non-bioinformaticians to run these types of analyses. Um, but then also uh, working with the community who developed specific uh, third-party tools that are specific to certain types of metagenomic analysis, whether it's the 16S databases or shotgun metagenomics and so forth. Um, you know, there's an interesting thing that um, the databases, because uh, it's been so dominated with the short read technologies, the databases are very biased towards short read information. Um, so, you know, the ITAGs, the V4, there is a ton of ITAG data in the databases, but by comparison, very few full-length 16S sequences. So I think it's going to be important to update those databases with the full-length information to really then leverage the power of the studies to come 
um, with regard to the classification um, potential. So in all three areas, we have a lot of improvements and futures planned uh, to make the, the technology more powerful and then make it more cost effective and more efficient uh, to be applied by the research community. Thank you. We have time for one more question today. And this one says, what about DNA quality for long read pack biosequencing in shotgun metagenomics? Getting long DNA fragments out of isolates can sometimes be challenging. Yeah, thank you. That is a that is a very good point. And um, uh, you know, the community didn't have the need for many years to uh, get multi kilobase fragments out of some of these um, communities or some of these isolates to characterize the metagenomic communities. And um, there is, um, so we are working on that, but not in isolation. Um, there, the research community and um, many companies have developed kits that uh, can be utilized to get longer fragments out. Um, just uh, uh, one example, I talked to um, Shinichi Morishita, he's a researcher at the University of Tokyo, uh, and he found an old protocol from over 10 years ago. Uh, it's a lysozyme uh, protocol that he applied to stool samples, microbiome samples, and found that it's very efficient in getting 8 to 10 kilobase fragments out of stool samples, which is um, uh, really ideal for then following up with PEC biosequencing. And so, uh, he presented this work um, uh, last summer at a conference in Tokyo and Japan, and the poster on this um, much better characterization of these gut microbiome samples actually won the won the prize at that conference for best poster. Um, so there are uh, kits that are available um, um, from a number of companies that adapt now um, their protocols to long read uh, long fragments. Um, we'd like to um, also work with the community in sort of a crowd-based uh, effort because it's very useful to uh, curate and collect that information so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if you have uh, success with certain samples, and of course the challenge here is that um, there are so many different environments, right? You have marine environments, ocean water, lake water, you have soil environments, you have, um, and the soil even can be very different. So uh, there is no one uh, type of solution that's possible here because the sample types are so different. You know, you know in, even in the human, you have the gut microbiome and then you have skin microbiomes and so forth, and they may require very different DNA isolation procedures. So um, we uh, really encourage and welcome the community to publish all of those, um, even if not in peer-reviewed publications, as notes and blogs or just send it to us and then we can post it. Uh, there are many of these uh, forums where this type of information can be posted. So it's really a community effort, but we see um, over the years where I would say it was very challenging a few years ago, there are now a, a number of uh, established protocols and uh, companies that really have um, invested in this area and are now offering products that, that can be used there. So I think uh, your, your question is very uh, valid that, that can be challenging, but I would say it's definitely getting less challenging as more and more people practice it and uh, optimize these types of procedures to get long DNA out of those um, uh, samples. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jonas Kolak for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labritz for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2018. You will receive an email from Labroots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.